It has been an indeterminate amount of time since Roger Wilco rocketed away from Vohal's burning space fortress. Time stands still for our hero in suspended animation. Its engines long spent, the small escape pod drifts aimlessly through unfamiliar star fields, its course altered many times by small asteroids and space debris. Inside, Roger lies undisturbed in his sleep chamber, but not for long. The pod, considered to be nothing more than another piece of scrap, is taken aboard a robot-commanded garbage freighter. Unfortunately, these robots have no regard for organics. The small pod is jarred by a sudden shock which triggers the sleep chamber's revive mode. As the glass shroud slides back, Roger slowly begins to regain consciousness. You notice that the sounds from the pod grow softer until they are imperceptible. Having served its purpose and taxed its resources, the pod gives a final hum and shuts down. And with that, we begin Space Quest 3, the Pirates of Pestilon here on Saving Often. Hello, dear viewers. My name is Rick, and I am recording a rare Sunday morning edition of Saving Often here. I have my morning coffee, and uh, it's a very pleasant feeling to be playing Space Quest 3 while drinking a wonderful cup of coffee. Um, so in Space Quest 2, we, uh, we discovered that we had a... An evil villain behind the Sarian plot from Space Quest 1. Sludge Vohal was, uh, was then foiled by us as he attempted a new plan to flood Xenon with a, uh, with a crew of cloned door-to-door -door salesmen. Um, and as we escaped his asteroid base, we were running out of oxygen in the pod, so we fell asleep in a cryostasis chamber, uh, which is where we pick up here in Space Quest 3. This, um, from what I can remember, is my dad's favorite space quest. I do remember him telling me that this was uh, this was his favorite out of all of them that he played. So uh, this is considered to be one of the best space quest games, as a matter of fact. Um, not my personal favorite, but uh, maybe objectively, maybe objectively the best. Um, I do love this. Uh, this iteration of Sierra's engine, their SCI engine. Um, this is the uh, a similar look and feel to, say, Quest for Glory 1 EGA and uh, the King's Quest 1 remake, um, Quest for Glory 2, uh, Leisure Suit Larry 3. A variety of games used this specific engine, and I've always felt that it's one of the uh, one of the best. This was when Sierra was really hitting their stride, so. Um, 
I'm playing, as always, with Roland MT32 emulation. The music in this game, I had no idea how good it actually was until many, many years later, uh, which, you know, just a couple years ago, that I realized that if you use MT32 emulation, you get this stunning, lifelike sound. Um, I had no idea that these somewhat creaky old games could sound this good. Uh, and as you heard, there's that little sound bite in the beginning where Roger asks himself, where am I? Um, all things that I never experienced on my first playthrough, so, uh, yeah, here we are, we are in this garbage freighter, and we need to find our way out. So the very first thing that I'd like to do here is check my pockets. And I am carrying a glowing gem. You are still carrying the piece of orium that you picked up on Labion during your last adventure. However, it has long since lost its glow. Alright, let's have a look around. You are standing in a debris-cluttered junk bay. An escape pod rests in the middle of the room. There are chunks of metal lying around which seem to be small sections of old spaceware. Gonna bump the speed up a little bit. That's better. Mm, look at Shuttle. This is the escape pod which safely whisked you away from Vohal's burning asteroid fortress. The skin of the pod plainly registers the cumulative damage long periods of space travel can inflict on a small craft such as this. Um, can I look at this little device here? Uh, a closer look at the object on the floor reveals that it is a warp motivator. It looks a bit more high-tech than the other junk strewn about this locale. Sturdily constructed, its only protrusion is a modular plug near its base. Plenty of cool stuff to look at here. Let's look at the rockets. Uh, this ship is another fine but worthless Acme product. This bulbous craft looks like it has seen a lot of action in its day. You believe it to be a bowtie fighter dating back to the Cologne Wars, a true relic. Hmm. I think that ship says Jupiter. Look at Jupiter. The ship says Jupiter 2. This baby must have been floating around out there for a long time. It doesn't hold your interest for very long. Yeah, that Jupiter ship has always thrown me off because it looks an awful lot like the space bar from Corona. Uh, just the domed shape and the window in the back where at one point our uh, ashy remains from failing at the... Uh, at the slot machine in the bar, uh, were dumped unceremoniously into the desert sands. Uh, but I don't know if that likeness is intended. Uh, what's this plate? They look like pieces of metal which have been welded together. Can I take it? No. Can I take any junk? Yow! It's obvious that the metal was sharper than you. The resulting laceration turns you into a living fountain, at least for a few moments. Unfortunately for you, this show was your finale. Good luck in the afterlife. One way to lower your blood pressure. A brave but fatal attempt at arterial arts. Oh, and we haven't saved. So, not that it matters, we're at the beginning. Space Quest 2 had a lot of the signature uh, abrasive sarcasm of the series, but I think this is when it, uh, it really starts to kind of come into its own as far as just being a total jerk to you for your mistakes. Various types of abandoned spacecraft litter the floor of this intergalactic junkyard. All this place needs is a junkyard dog. You shiver at the thought. There actually was a junkyard dog here at one point in the game's development. Uh, there are pictures that are uh, that are available online of some blurry scans, I think of Interaction Magazine with the Space Quest 3 promo that shows a, uh, a green junkyard dog prowling about, so... Um, I wonder if, uh, if it's actually in the game files. It might be. I'll have to check into that. Yep, 
you are overwhelmed by the variety of space trash around each corner. A large bucket conveyor carries shredded ships to a horizontal conveyor high above. So we can ride that conveyor up. Um, but I'm not quite ready to do that just yet. There's a little more that I want to explore first. You are quite impressed by the size of this junk freighter. The skeletal remains of a stripped down space tanker stage lie half buried in scrap. Stage. Not much remains. If there was anything of value, it was stripped away a long time ago. Now look at that skeleton. It appears to be another metallic menace whose time has come and gone. Hopefully fate will be kinder to you. Someone, or something, has done a real job on this tanker. Was this the result of some space battle? Or perhaps you're not the only one roaming around in here? Let's look at these wires. Except for the one on the left, most of the wires here look dangerously worn. Let's take the wires. You take the only decent piece of wire available. The gutted carcass of the tanker opens up to reveal even more junk. A metal head rests nearby. Wow, an ancient model of a battle bot. I bet you'd hate to run into whatever brought this big guy down. It looks like something poked it in the eye. Indeed. There are two eyes on the battle bot head. One of them has been broken. Let's save our first game. We're going to be a little more descriptive with our saves here, but I have nothing better to say, so I will just plug the name of my channel once again, Saving Coffin. Uh, climb head. And we can climb right through that eye, and we are even further into the junk freighter here. You find yourself at the bottom of another trash pit. An interesting array of alien artifacts is strewn from one end to the other. A large ship is in the middle, and a small one is off to one side. The small ship. It's a cute little thing. You've never seen anything like it in these parts, but then where are these parts? Some writing on its exterior reads, for a good time, don't call hell. The large ship. It's a sleek looking number if you can disregard the junk it's rooted in. It must be a recent addition to the collection as everything seems to be intact. Etched on each side is the name Aluminum Mallard. On top is a small hatch. Can I climb the ship? You're not in a good location for climbing that. Uh, the ship is too slick. You seem to remember an ectomorphic programmer friend telling you about ships with non-stick coatings for greater debris collision tolerance. Hmm. So we need to get up onto that ship somehow. We're also going to need to power it. Let's climb back up. Okay, so that's as far as we can go there. Let's head back to that conveyor belt. I hate that screen because I can never tell if Roger's walking or not through that tunnel. Love the little effect of walking through the shadow of the Acme rocket there. Now 
right, we are now riding the conveyor belt. Let's save our game. Let's see what happens if I fall into the shredder. Shredded like an Iran Contra document, your many independent parts flutter to the bottom of the hopper. This is of little importance to you, what with your being dead and all. It slices, it dices. You're a less than choice cut, Wilco. Okay. Let's slow this down a touch and try standing and jumping. Much better. All right, let's look around. You are standing on a narrow rail suspended high above the floor of the freighter. A conveyor belt below leads to a grinder. Be careful, it's a long way down. Is it? You stepped off the rail. You're dead again. Way to go. Haven't we taught you anything? Deceleration trauma. It wouldn't be so bad except for the sudden stop at the end. Next time, don't get so close to the edge. Okay, uh, you are standing on a narrow rail suspended high above the floor at the far end of the freighter. It's a long way down to the junk piles below. Yes, indeed. Um, oh, you step on a part of the track which is extremely narrow and greasy. It obviously wasn't designed for human foot travel. It's a quick drop to the unforgiving surface below. Let's head over this way, this time. In this room, the rail makes a U-turn. There is a machine here which hangs under the rail. There is a chute at the bottom. In the middle are panels of monitoring devices being tended to by a droid. The droid is not a model you've seen before. The droid appears to be dedicated to this workstation. It seems harmless enough. It apparently isn't designed to process input from you. The computers are similar to the one you are currently viewing. The only difference is that you can't read what it says. Well, can I drop down into pod, get in pod, uh, get in train? That's not in the dictionary. Look at device. A grabber, there it is, a grabber hangs beneath a rail. There is a seat for a driver. There is a claw underneath that looks capable of grabbing things. Gets in grabber. There we go. Plopping into the seat, you grasp the forward-backward control of the grabber. Okay, let's look at the panel. Uh, no, that's not what I want to look at. Look at Grabber. From your seat, you see a handle, presently being gripped by you, which controls motion, and a button marked claw. Let's press the claw. Finding nothing here to carry, the claw begins the ascent to the Grabber unit. So we need to try to grab that little actuator unit thingy. See if that's close enough. The claw senses contact with the warp motivator, grasps it firmly, and begins the ascent back to the grabber. Yes, I've technically solved that puzzle before I knew that it was a puzzle. Um, the aluminum mallard is not powered, so 
Um, we would need this warp motivator in order to get it out of the garbage scow. I remember the beginning of Space Quest 3 very clearly because I've played through this part many times, um, but I, if I'm not mistaken, I've only played through the actual game proper maybe twice. Maybe not even that, maybe just once. Okay, so let's save. Um, got more motivator, and let's press that claw button. Sensing an adequate surface, the claw releases its cargo and begins the ascent to the grabber unit. The object thuds into place within the cavity of the ship. So now, in order to get back down to the junk pile, we need to slip down one of these chutes over here. Fortunately, you come to a relatively soft landing in a pile of debris. <laughs> You can hear something scurrying around above you. You can't actually see the rats because they're hidden in the shadows. Once again, I love the lighting. You seem to be in a debris-encrusted hollow. Poking out of the ceiling is the chute which you originally entered through. Some crusty lamps linked by non-UL-approved wire provide additional illumination. Hmm, can I take that wire? It won't help me now. Well, there's a ladder here. It's a low-tech ascent descent module. Well, let's climb up, shall we? Bending aside a thin piece of scrap, you find an opening into another area and climb on in. Alright, so we're back here, and now, let's take that ladder. You grab the ladder and jam it in your pocket. Ouch. Alright, excellent. So let's take a quick stock of our inventory here. We have a uh, wire from that passageway and a ladder. Look at the wire. It's a piece of SQ-approved electrical wire. And this is a ladder. The evenly spaced rungs allow altitude adjustment. All right. Let's climb back in here. And let's see about getting into the aluminum mallard. Place the ladder, climb the ladder. You notice it to be slick up here. Be careful. We warned you to be careful. Did you listen? No. Good luck next time. Oh man, another terrifying image from my youth. Roger with half a frickin' head, blood strewn across the floor. Good God. There's a kid that scared the crap out of me. We're also going to see the uh, Roger Melting picture, which was reused in Space Quest 1 VGA, so uh, looking forward to that horrifying visage. Climb that ladder. And open the hatch. You move into position and, grabbing the dull finish of the hatch's handle, commence to open and enter the ship. Okay, at first you are surprised at how intact the ship's interior is. Immediately to your right is a panel with a red button. At midship on the right wall is the ship's main diagnostic computer. 
directly across are two passenger seats. Ahead of you is the cockpit. The two passenger seats look quite comfortable. However, the pilot seat is where you'd rather plop your butt. Look at the cockpit. Why not go sit down and take a look? I'm not ready yet. Look at screen. Access denied. Power critically low. Auxiliary reactor not online. Insufficient power to commence with systems check. Using stored power below 10%. The button is clearly labeled Ramp, Open, and Close. What's that on the floor? The floor of the cabin consists mainly of a ramp that is currently shut. An access panel has been removed to reveal an empty reactor compartment. You look into the cavity and notice only two cable ends. Someone has made off with the ship's power supply. Uh, that's right, so the warp motivator wasn't what I needed to start the thing. I need a power supply. What's that button say? Oh, I already looked at that. Alright, let's climb out. <sighs> Can I open the hatch? The ramp is immobilized, but the junk it's lying in, so you exit through the hatch instead. So we need a power supply. And where have we seen power so far? Well, we saw it in the junk pile by the rats. Those lights were powered and strung up by wire. So why don't we head down there and pilfer their power. I forgot the letter. You grab the letter and jam it in your pocket. Ouch! Again. There we go. Now we have our ladder back. Let's save before we go down here. Can I just climb down? No. Can I place the ladder? Okay. Climb down. There we go. Now let's take another look around here. How do I... Look at the lights. The aging lamps add extra light to the area. Overused wires link them to power. And I can't take the wires, huh? Look at power supply. Look at battery. Can't remember exactly what I need to do here. Look at ship. Look at debris. Look at wire. Some brittle looking wire runs from lamp to lamp and then disappears into a hole to the left. Look in hole. You peer into the small opening and notice a tiny reactor which seems to be providing power for the lights. Take that reactor. You unhook the reactor from the cheap wires and take it with you. Now it's dark. Climb this ladder again. Take this ladder again. And now, let's head back to the aluminum mallard.
You seem to have been mugged by some type of large rat. As you pick loose fur from your teeth, you notice a less bulky feeling. And sure enough, the rotten bastard stole my wires and my reactor. Well, that simply will not do. Let's go back and get that reactor again. Hey, he also stole 20 points from my score. Take the reactor. And take the wires. Climb the ladder. And take the ladder. All right, much better. Rotten little rat bastard. Okay, place the ladder, climb the ladder, take the ladder. No, oh, you don't need it up here. Okay, fine. And open the hatch. All right, let's save that game again. And place the reactor. You drop the reactor into the hole. In attempting to reconnect the cables, you find that one is much too short. Connect wire. You carefully connect the wire between the ship and the reactor, putting the tile back in place once you've finished. Now let's look at that screen. Power level nominal, auxiliary reactor, online. Looks like this bird's in good shape. Great. Let's sit in the cockpit. And look at the cockpit. You are sitting in the pilot seat of this sporty little ship. In front of you is the control panel, which contains a computer screen. Oh boy, okay, we are currently in sector 75 with no course selected and we have a variety of options here. Well, let's start with our engines. Thrust generation underway. Adequate thrust achieved. All right, well, can't think of anything else to do but take off. You feel a strong rumbling as the ship strains to loosen itself from the confines of the junk heap accumulated at its base. Finally, it begins to rise. The ship rises successfully but collides with the top of the freighter. The resulting explosion sends a potpourri of flesh and metal fragments careening in all directions. Learn to drive that thing. Your radar is designed to avoid just such an occurrence. <laughs> well, now we'll sit and look at the screen. Let's use our radar. Radar is now in operation. Now, let's start our engines. And take off. You feel a strong rumbling as the ship strains to loosen itself. The ship rises several meters, then stops abruptly. An alarm from the computer attracts your attention. Ascent halted due to obstruction. Well? 
Okay. Can I, uh... Of course, must be selected. Uh, can I do my navigation system? Inoperable will not in flights. Okay, fine. I can't cruise. Darn. I know what I have to do, but I was hoping that I could blow myself up. Weapon systems. We have shields, we have controls, and we can fire. Fire. The shot blasts a new orifice in the side of the junk freighter. Unfortunately, your inadequately protected ship is struck and subsequently destroyed in the bottleneck of metallic objects striving to pass through the same relatively small opening. Sudden decompression sucks. Sit in the cockpit. Look at the screen. Start the radar. Start the engines. Generate the thrust. And take off. There is, in fact, one thing that we forgot to do before leaving this garbage scow. Start our weapon systems and add shields to the front of the ship. The pressure generated by the desire of the ship's atmosphere to escape to the considerably lower pressure of space causes your ship to be spit out like a watermelon seed. And now we can save our game, because we are in space. Look out window. Wow, a bunch of stars. Not exactly a new sight for your space-weary eyes. All right, let's take a look here at our navigation system. We found the planet Ortega in Sector 82. Its habitants are unknown. It is a volcanic crater-strewn surface. We have found the planet Fleabutt. It is in Sector 35. It is a light atmosphere and one known settlement. Ah, the Monolith Burger. A fast food dive. It is in Sector 62. A finite number has been served. Well, Ortega seems like a fine bet, right? Stand by, calculating course. Course locked. Identity confirmed. Roger Wilco, case OU812. Wilco wanted for vending machine fraud. Plaintiff, Jipazoid Novelty Company. Judgment. Terminate. A flashing message on your monitor attracts your attention. Throttling engines back, orbiting planet Ortega. No right. Let's uh let's save that game. Ortega. Look at our screen once more. Let's land on the planet Ortega. With a mighty whump, you set the aluminum mallard down on the surface of Ortega. Look out the window. Outside, the stark surface of Ortega stretches into the distance. A lava lover's paradise, to be sure. Yeah, let's press that ramp button. And head out onto the surface. My, my, this is one hot planet. Hopefully you'll last more than a few minutes. The 
the planet Ortega is truly a lava lover's paradise. Volcanic activity constantly reshapes its surface, so if you have any maps older than last week, throw them out. Too late, you realize that walking around unprotected on this planet is hazardous to your health. You feel your blood begin to boil. You sizzle into oblivion. This planet wouldn't be so bad if you could keep cool somehow. It's so hot, you could fry a Vorlian phlegm snake egg. Hmm. So Ortega is not necessarily going to be our first destination. Let's take a look at our nav system one more time, and let's scan. So we have the planet Fleabutt, and we also have the Monolith Burger. Let's head to the Monolith Burger. That seems like a relatively safe place. Flashing message on your monitor attracts your attention. Throttling engines back, approaching Monolith Burger. Hey, that's a familiar looking starship. With the docking maneuver completed, the engine shut down. Welcome to Monolith Burger. You pop the hatch and ramble on in. The decor, like the food, is the same in monolith burgers all over the universe. Generic counter clerks are eagerly waiting to help you. Diverse life forms are crowded around the counter and sitting in booths consuming what can only loosely be termed food. Can I look at the life forms? Your eyes take in the diversity of alien forms without much interest. After all, you're quite a spacefaring kind of guy. Huh, what's this machine? Astro Chicken by Scumsoft. Astro Chicken must land on the Astro Chicken landing pad. He's depending on you to bring him to safety. Well, unfortunately, we don't have any Buckazoids. You don't even have a buck. So, we can't do anything with Astro Chicken at the moment. A recent graduate of Pinhead University, the clerk obviously doesn't have the words fast food in his vocabulary. A trained Vorlian wart slug could probably do a better job. Oh, look at that menu. A mini monolith, a monolith with poly cheese. Filet au orat, jumbo monolith with poly cheese. Big Belcher combo, includes a jumbo mono with poly cheese, space spuds with extra grease, and a sloppy slurper. The monolith fun meal, or simply space spuds. Also featuring tang, in small, medium, and large, or as a sloppy slurper. Oops, that was Ortega. I don't want to save it that way. I want to save it as Monolith Burger. Let's go in here. Out of my airlock, geek. Hm. <laughs> That's it for you, bozo. Don't trust guys in black spacesuits. A pulse laser blast to the forehead is not your idea of fun. 
Fortunately, it didn't hit anything important. Well, there doesn't seem much that we can do. Doesn't seem to be much that we can do here at Monolith Burger at the moment. We have no money. So, let's get back in the ship. You slide back into the ship, closing the hatch behind you. The docking control beam begins guiding you safely clear of Monolith Burger. Well, once again, we head back to our nav system. Without much to do here at Monolith Burger, there's only one other place to go. The planet Fleabutt. Orbiting the planet Fleabutt. With a mighty whump, you set the aluminum mallard down on the surface of Fleabutt. As you step out of your ship onto the surface of Fleabutt, you are hit in the face by the harsh winds. It looks like a storm is brewing. Meanwhile, another spacecraft touches down elsewhere on the surface of the planet. Well, that certainly isn't good. I do love the planet Fleabutt, though. This might be one of my favorite planets in all of Space Quest. I love the purple dunes and the deep blue sky and the brewing storms in the background. You see several large rocks here. One rock has a large overhang and almost appears to be a cave. Under the overhang, you see several large pulsating pods. They look friendly. They're not friendly. Thanks for playing Space Quest 3. As usual, you've been a real hoot. Those pods are no good. Oh, hey, looky there. Look at Snake. You sure wish you had one like that. Hmm. Space is a very, very lethal place. Oh, okay, we, uh, we just kind of wrap around here, huh? Is there anything up this way? Your fear turns to curiosity as you realize that it is not a real beast, but a mechanical creation. Although it still looks dangerous, you can't decide whether to blast off this rock or inspect further the wonders of Fleabutt. Oh no, a venomous scorpizoid. Watch out. He looks friendly. What a cute little scorpizoid. Perhaps you should pick it up and take it with you. You'll have to get close enough first. 
the scorpozoid stinger hits its mark, sending electroplasmatic venom into your system. Death comes quickly. <sighs> so many ways to die. You see several large sand dunes and a few worn rocks. I wonder where that ship touched down, and if he's friendly. Now, oh, back to the Scorpozoid. They sure find a lot of interesting ways to kill you off in this game. Or these games, I should say. Hmm. The ground beneath your feet is composed of an unusually colored sand. Other than its bizarre coloration, you have no other interest in it. However, as you expectorate a mouthful of the wind-blown sand, you briefly reminisce about your adventure on Corona in Space Quest 1. There are unusually steep sand dunes here which have formed a deep hole. The desert to the north grows darker as storm clouds loom overhead. You find yourself at the base of a gigantic metal model of a great beast. There are two signs here. Uh, look at left sign. Read sign. Mog, one of the many large beasts that once roamed this vast desert. But they all eventually died of boredom and are now extinct. Sea flea butt from Mog's head. Entrance free. Sorry, temporary closed for repair. Just ahead, visit the Mog Memorial and the galaxy famous World of Wonder. Y'all come back now, you hear? Alien scum. Aha! A tourist trap. This giant metal facsimile of a space beast is nothing more than a cheap marketing ploy designed to suck in any moron dumb enough to fall for such trickery. You suddenly feel like a dumb moron. You peer through the glass of the display case and find a cute and cuddly little creature. A small sign on the glass informs you that this is an Antarian slime devil. How cute! It looks real, but not real important. And this is simply the other side of Mog. Oh, there's another Scorpozoid. Hmm. Alright, let's step in here and meet our friend Fester Blatz. Howdy, stranger! The name's Blatz, Fester Blatz. Welcome to the World of Wonders. Go ahead, have a look at some of the trendiest items in the known universe. Make the most of your vacation, Buckazoid. Hmm. Look at Alien. 
Imagine, if you will, a sleazy tourist trap in the middle of the howling desert on flea butt. The proprietor looks like the unfortunate offspring of a union between a squid and a Vorlian gas beast. His keen business mind and utter lack of scruples afford him a comfortable living here on the backside of civilization. Let's look at that skull. The shelves are arrayed with some fine examples of the natural wonders of this planet. Also, some worthless junk that can only be found in a fine tourist establishment such as this. You examine one of the many interesting postcards. Arrakis. Arrakis, a great spot for winter travel, Arrakis holds many delights for the adventurous vacationer. Nothing can compare with a blinding dust storm or being crushed by a sandworm. You examine one of the many interesting postcards. Black Hole Bertha. Like a giant interstellar vacuum, Black Hole Bertha comes sweeping through the galaxy. All travelers are advised to stay away from Bertha. Just buy the postcard, then tell everyone you went there. Beautiful Ortega. Ortega. The volcanoes of Ortega are constantly reshaping its surface. Dressed in heat-resistant underwear, the hardy traveler can find a lava lover's paradise on this starkly enjoyable planet. How about a nice ride right on a stick? The kids will just love this. We're talking hours of fun for the whole family. Just look how cute this little guy is. Now here's a red hot item, the official Astro Chicken flight hat. You'll really turn some heads in this sporty little number. It's modeled after the hot new arcade game that's sweeping the galaxy. Going to any high temp planets? This nice pair of Thermoweave underwear will keep your internal environment pleasant on even the sweatiest worlds. You just take your time, you hear? Don't feel pressured to buy anything. I want to keep looking at postcards. Roberta Land. Roberta Land. Come join the fun at the fun park of the future. See characters from your favorite stories come to life again and again. Recently revised, so don't miss a single thrilling scene. This one's just black. Beta Alpha Starless Region. Looking for some real solitude? Come to a place that's so far from everything that you can't even see stars. Mind-numbing boredom greets you as you drift aimlessly through nothing. A must for the brain dead. Wish you were here, instead of me. Acheron. Acheron. The friendly creatures of Acheron are a delight for young and old alike. Tame enough to come right up and caress you, yet wild enough to slash you to shreds if provoked. And back to Arrakis. Uh, let's ask about that Orat. He's not listening to you. He likes the sound of his own voice too much. Orat on a stick. Uh, ask about hat. Nope. Doesn't even seem to care. Look at figures? Hmm. So, I think that I need all of those things. Well, thanks for stopping by! Hey, looks like that lightning is getting close. Better be careful out there. Uh-oh. So, this is Roger Wilco, the man I have been sent across the universe to track down and terminate. I am not impressed. You are too easy to find. You tend to leave a mess wherever you go. Seems you forgot to pay for that lily beyond terror beast mating call whistle. Now let's see. With interest that comes to 400,000 buckazoids. I don't think you've got that kind of cash on you, hmm? No, I didn't think so. The good people at the Jipazoid Novelty Company are most displeased. Non-payment is a serious offense. But lucky for you, I am in a good mood today. I will count to ten real slow, then I track you down. If you make it to your ship, I forget I see you. But if I catch you again, I dust you like bunt cake. Well. We have just met Arnoid the Annihilator. Annihilator. No, I did spell that wrong. Annihilator. There we go. 
I swear I can spell. Well, we've got to get the hell away from this guy. Hey, wait a minute. Before I do, read the sign. Oh, look at the door. It looks like Fester is closed up. The door is closed and locked. Hmm. So, there are once again two ways that we can deal with this little problem, much like the Orat and the Spider Droid from Space Quest 1. Ah, footprints. That's another nice thing about the uh, SCI EGA parser games is that you can start typing and the game pauses while you type, unlike the AGI games like Space Quest 2, which uh, just keep on going, so uh, slow the game down or type really fast. Anyway, I digress. Hmm, the footprints seem to be following you. I wonder who they could belong to. Well, that explains what Arnoid will do if he catches us. So yeah, um, like I said, I think there's two ways that we can deal with this little problem. And this is one of them. Look at body. No, uh, just look. Oh, well, we can't even get close to his remains. Thanks to the pod. I thought they would at least explain what happened there. So, let's try that again. see his footprints this time. There he is. Oop. Nope. Too slow. Okay, let's try this again. Look at Annihilator. Look at Arnoid. The Terminator is now a pile of junk lying on the sand under the pustules. Looking closely, you notice that the Terminator's invisibility belt has survived relatively intact. Get closer. Yeah, so we can't take it because we will get uh, eaten by the pod as well. And if I'm not mistaken, that's why we might need the Orat on a stick. But there's another way of dealing with this little menace. Get in elevator. Get on lift. Look. You are inside one of Mog's legs. There is an elevator shaft, complete with elevator, leading up into the interior. Oh, we just entered like this. Um, press the button. Oh, 
Oh boy, let's take a look here. You are within the cavernous interior of Mog's Belly. An elevator shaft leads down, and stairs run between the first and second level platforms. The heavy equipment necessary to automate Mog can be seen on the upper level. Oh, here he comes. Look at the equipment. The large electric motor providing power for Mog's automation hums noisily away on the second level platform. Hmm, look at the hook. Look at the gears. It appears that the gears provide the power linkage for the machinery moving Mog's arms and jaw. It seems that they haven't heard of OSHA here on Fleabutt. There isn't even a guardrail around them. I sure wouldn't want to fall in there. I see you, Wilco. Grab pulley. Reaching up, you give the rope pulley a mighty shove. Okay, so we're going to need to do something with that pulley. Let's try this one more time. Yeah, I remember... I remember this being a puzzle solution, but I don't remember precisely what I need to do about it. It's okay, we'll figure it out. Can I push this one? Reaching up, you give the rope pulley a mighty shove. Unfortunately, the pulley has come to the end of its track. Okay, let's try waiting here. And we'll wait for you. Push the pulley. Oops. Reaching up, you give the rope pulley a mighty shove. There we go. And that crushes him into a handful of pieces. Look at Terminator. The Terminator is now a pile of junk on the first level platform. Look at junk. Looking closely, you notice that the Terminator's invisibility belt has survived relatively intact. So, that gets us the invisibility belt, but it also gave us fewer points. I think that the pod is the way that we need to go. Um, oh, hey, it's faster. Hey, what's going on here? Didn't you read the sign saying we're closed for repairs? Ah, I see you've gotten rid of that grease-swilling android. Never did like that Terminator series. Good riddance to bad circuits. Well, you might as well ride down with me. So, that deals with Arnoid the Annihilator. And that will also end today's playthrough of Space Quest 3. When we return next week, we're going to see about dealing with him using those pods, because, quite honestly, I want those sweet, sweet points. Anyway, thank you very much for joining me. As always, I appreciate your support. Please like, please subscribe, or don't if that's your thing. Hey, whatever. I just appreciate you watching this and listening to me ramble on about my memories and uh, about my love of these crusty old adventure games. So, uh, again, thank you for watching, and I look forward to seeing you again next week as we continue Space Quest Three: The Pirates of Pestilon. Take care of yourself.